most of the people here? Yes, I think I know most of the people, but for the benefit of the group, just in case a few don't, my name's Joe. Uh, I'm one of the lecturers uh, here at Harper. I'm, uh, I'm not a data scientist, I'm, I'm a biologist and chemist, but I dabble in some of the data science tools and particularly some of the tools or the tool that we're going to look at today. So to kick things off, I thought I would start with a little menti type quiz. Only a couple of questions. I need literally two questions to uh, to go through. But if you could go to menti.com and then put in the code and then ask, answer this question. Have you heard of generative AI? Um, and there's one more question after this. Um, I'm reasonably confident given the group assembled here that you probably have heard of generative AI, but let's see what the uh, what the results are uh, in, in a second. Um, and if not, I can give a very short uh, overview of my perspective on generative AI. But if we're all uh, if we're all in agreement, but we know what it is, then I won't uh, sort of. OK. OK, so it looks like the majority of us have heard of generative AI and uh, because of that, I won't delve into it uh, too much. Here. If there was a hard no, I would have delved into it. But for the sort of hopefully uh, today's session will help clarify exactly uh, what generative AI is. OK, so the next question then is, uh, have you used generative AI? This doesn't have to be chat GPT, though that is arguably the most popular of the generative AI sort of um, models that is currently available. Um, so I can see the majority of you have. Now I don't have a mentee to try and gauge what people have been using it for, but if you could just drop in the chat or if you're willing to unmute your microphone, what you've been using it for, I'd be interested to hear the kinds of things that you've been using it for. Let's open up the old chat just in case. So generating R code from Juliana. OK. Yeah, good. Anyone else? So 83% of you said you've been using it, but what have you been using it for? Reviewing abstracts and introductions, playing with animation, improving text. OK, so pretty broad range of use cases, writing in good slash better English, playing with text, some for R and Python code, PDF summary. OK, so broadly similar themes there, I think. So it's mostly to augment workflow to rather than replace workflows. And that is also the way that I've been using it as well for various things. Juliana has got a novel approach there to you doing risk assessments. Yeah, I advocate full use of that. Risk assessments are uh, not necessarily the most fun things to write. So if you can lubricate that process, then good. But yeah, I have been using it for very similar things myself. And I'll give you an overview of Ch ChatGPT in a second. But I want to first just introduce the data that we're going to be looking at today. So my first question is, do you know what that is on the screen? I'll give you a clue, it's an insect. You can just drop your answers into the uh, to the chat if you wish, or shout out, I don't mind. Yep, thrip. Aphid? No, it's not an aphid, I'm afraid. Ed's got the right answer straight away. Thrips. So it's a thrips. Thrips is a weird one because you have to pluralize it even if it's an individual. So it's a uh, thrips. And more specifically, it's a Western flower thrips. So it's one of the big pests in global horticultural production systems, anywhere where there's warm and humid, warmth and humidity. So glasshouse environments, polytunnels major major problem of lots of different crops it's um it's feeding damage uh, on plants and particularly fruits such as peppers sweet peppers particularly problematic because it leaves this really uh this this scarring that's really um reduces the market marketability of the of the of the various fruits but it impacts but it also vectors um diseases as well so it's a really big concern um and this isn't about it being a pest, and that's just for background information. Uh, this is more of an, uh, a fundamental uh, data set that has some interesting data in it, I hope. So this is not pest related whatsoever. It just happens to be a well-studied organism because of its pest status. And 
do you know what covers uh, an insect? So obviously we have skin. What is the equivalent of skin in an insect called? There's at least two entomologists in the chat, so three entomologists in the chat, so hopefully I can get the right answer. Cuticle? Yep, exactly, it's a cuticle. And um, do you know what the cuticle is covered in? This is an educational biology lesson as well as a uh, data science lesson today. Disgusting hydrocarbons, exactly, Ed. So they're covered in cuticular hydrocarbons, which are these really long chain chemicals. Typically, these are chemicals that have, I don't know, somewhere between 10 to 40 different carbons. So if you refresh your memory all the way back to sort of A-level chemistry, each point here is a different carbon. And uh, the insect, and this is not just thrips, this is all in uh, insects and indeed most invertebrates are covered in these hydrocarbons and they're really important because they have a function and most of those functions are to allow them to survive so desiccation resistance thermoregulation disease protection camouflage so chemical camouflage and then chemical communication and the one that we're interested in today or the the data set we're interested in today is this chemical communication um aspect so a lot of uh, a lot of thrip species communicate using these cuticular hydrocarbons. They serve as pheromones. So pheromones are just chemicals that mediate interactions between two organisms of the same species. And there are lots of different um, pheromones uh, found in thrips: sex pheromones, aggregation pheromones, um, mating pheromones, dispersal pheromones, those kinds of things. And they all have these really important behavioral functions. Um, but these are pretty well, 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 they're pretty poorly characterized and really ripe for lots of study. So I've been working with Keele University um, to try and characterize the particular hydrocarbons of Western flower thrips from across the globe, which is actually more challenging than uh, you might think because they're incredibly small. So they tend to be a couple of millimeters in length, which means that there's not a lot of chemicals there to actually analyze and uh, it's much harder than you think to get a representative uh, example because lots of factors influence the cuticular hydrocarbon profile geographic region the host plant that the thrips is feeding on those kinds of things will have this uh, this impact as well as age uh, sex um, things like that so it's it's actually more challenging than it first appears so how do we analyze <coughs> excuse me how do we analyze the cuticular hydrocarbons well basically you take a portion usually 10 to 20 individuals you put them in these really small glass um, vials which are basically just pieces of glass um, or the glass pipettes pasture pipettes snapped off at the end you put your thrips in those you put them into this instrument here which is a gas chromatograph coupled mass spectrometer which basically is fancy technical uh, terminology for separating out chemicals and identifying them so the gas chromatograph separates out complex mixtures. The mass spectrometer uses a fingerprint approach to uh, identifying chemicals based on the uh, the fragmentation uh, pattern when it's passed through high energy. Now, it's not really a, a chemistry lesson, so that's where we'll leave the sort of chemical analysis component. But what that does is it gives us this opportunity to collect uh, data like this. So this is an example of the sort of data that we've got to analyze using chat GPT with the code interpreter in a second. But I thought I'd just slice out a portion just so I can explain it to you um, in a little bit of detail before we head over to chat uh, GPT. So the structure of this data is pretty standard. This is how most chemical ecology data is uh, generated. So it doesn't really matter what study system you're using. If you're analyzing your samples using GCMS, uh, then this is typically how it's recorded. So you have your sample ID. So this is the individual sample formed of however many thrips are in it. And you see we've got multiple uh, samples there, replicates. We then have a group identification. So this is WF7. So this is Western flower thrips num uh, group number seven. I can't remember exactly what that correlates to, but it would be in the data dictionary. 
Then here across the top, we have C2, C3, da, 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 up to C79. So these are the chemical compounds, and we've replaced the actual chemical name with C2, C3, purely because it's much easier to do that. Some of these chemical names can be very long, very complex, uh, not necessarily that easy. So we've simply replaced it with these uh, shortened versions. You'll note that it doesn't start at C1, and that's because not every chemical component that we identify in a sample is necessarily uh, originating from the sample. There's this thing called peak carryover, or there may be um, column bleed from the column that's inside the GCMS, and those create peaks, but are not necessarily uh, chemicals of interest. And we can tell they're not chemicals of interest because they have non-biological components like silicon and things like that in them. So we can exclude those. So we're left with uh, this very uh, clear set of chemicals that have a biological origin. OK, that's all the slides I've got. Are there any questions at this point about the uh, the study system or indeed the data that uh, is generated from the study system? Or are we quite clear? Just give me a thumbs up or a yes in the chat if you're if you're happy. I'll also take silence as a yes. Looking good from Ed. OK, good. So we will exit the PowerPoint. That was just for context. And oh, don't need that. We need this. So for those of you who are perhaps uh, less familiar um, with ChatGPT, you can uh, pay a monthly subscription to ChatGPT or to OpenAI to access different uh, GPT models, uh, of which I have done because I've been using it increasingly so, and I was convinced by uh, the Twitter sphere that um, GPT-4 was worth the uh, worth the investment. So unless you're a subscriber, you won't see these options at the top. So GPT 3.5 is the sort of standard model that is freely available to um, to everyone, uh, and then GPT-4 is um, is is the group of models that is uh, only available to the the subscribers. And within that, we've got three different uh, models to choose from. There were four. There was a web browsing <coughs> function um, model as well, but that has been um, temporarily taken off uh, off the actual service for reasons that I'm not entirely uh, sure of. I don't think it's been announced. But at the moment, you have access to three three models. So there's a default model, which is basically the same as 3.5, but more advanced. It does the same same things, has the same uh, functions and features. Then we have the code interpreter, which is the one that we will look at uh, today. And then there is this one called plugins, which uh, very briefly uh, allows you to access third party uh, plugins to do certain things. So the ones I've got here are uh, Vox script, which I've been using to summarize transcripts from YouTube videos, Scholar AI to uh, harvest PDFs from Google Scholar and uh, analyze them, and then Wolfram Alpha for uh, mathematical sort of queries, conversions, those kinds of things. And there are lots more that you can install, but you can only have three active at one time. I think there's something like 700 plugins available at this time. So there's lots of opportunity and uh, lots of fun things you can do with them. But we're not interested in uh, that. We're interested in the code interpreter. OK, so code interpreter, what is it? Well, Ed has already alluded to it. Um, already. It's basically uh, GPT-4 with the ability to execute Python code. So it's a sandbox environment. It is somewhat limited, and we'll see that as we go through uh, the example um, today, in that uh, it's a Python environment with a pre-installed uh, set of um, packages. And those packages basically may or may not have all of the functionality that you need or want. So there are limitations to the code interpreter. It's not a complete solution to every problem, but by and large, it's a pretty good solution to many of the problems, but it's not perfect. So the other GPT-4 models that we've already looked at, you can't upload your uh, data files or any data to them. You just have to interact with the, the model uh, using uh, text basically. So you type in prompts and it will do whatever you ask it within reason. Uh, the code interpreter actually allows us to upload a file 
to the model that can then be read and uh, you can interact with the file or indeed uh, execute Python code on there. So I'll just go ahead and load the file that we were talking about. Excuse my poor filing system. It's in here somewhere. There it is. So I've just given it a general generic data.csv. So this data I should point out is part of a publication that I'm in the middle of writing. Normally I have a better naming system for my files. I don't usually just call them data, but for the purposes of today, because I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to uh, change any file that I am act actively working on. I've just given it a generic file name that I can then delete once I've finished today. Okay, so we've uploaded the file. It's been accepted. Um, there's been no errors. So then we have to uh, write a prompt to interact with uh, with that data file. So the first thing I should probably highlight is that for this data file, if I can just if I open up the raw file to show you, is that for the purposes of demonstration, there is no data dictionary. So it's just the data. I know what these things mean, but you don't. But this is part of what I wanted to show you today. And you can see it's structured the way that I outlined it on the um, on the pre on the presentation. So there's no data dictionary. So the first prompt that I'm going to feed this is: Can you write a data dictionary for the attached file? And then you'll see that it will start thinking and processing. So this working is it doing stuff uh, in the background, so Python code. So you can click to expand that and it will show you the Python code uh, that it's using. So all it's done here is import the uh, the package into the environment. So pandas, a very common one, loaded the data, previewed the data. This is that preview, so the output of that code here. And you can see that it's read it across there. Then underneath, <coughs> it's given us a very brief summary of what is in the data file. So 72 columns, and it's taking a closer look at them. And uh, they're using inf that information to basically uh, contain uh, or create a data uh, dictionary. So it's then uh, formatted this into a table. So it won't go through the whole thing. So you'll see there it skipped a large proportion of the samples in the middle, but it's still got a pretty decent number of uh, rows in the uh, in the table. So the data dictionary has given us its column name, so sample group, uh, whatever it is, and then it's the data type, a description, uh, how many unique values there are, that kind of thing. Some of this stuff is pretty irrelevant, to be honest. Uh, only these two here, the number of unique values is probably relevant because these are numerical values related to the the measurement of the sort of the quantity of the chemical found on the on the cuticle. So that's fine. Uh, gives us some basic information. If you had no idea about what the data was, you could maybe glean some information from that, um, but not overly useful. But then we didn't provide it with a huge amount of context, so uh, that's fine. So I'm going to throw the floor open to you guys as much as me. Um, we are going to be looking at sort of a key more. Oh, Matt, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so it, where where is that table now? Is it going to put it in a separate tab in the in an Excel or how do uh, you save it? So if you want to save it, you can just say export this table as a CSV file and it will do it for me. I usually don't bother with that kind of thing. I usually just wait to the very end and ask it to export all of the outputs in one go. Um, but here you'll see that it uh, has saved it as a CSV file. I can click on that. It will allow me to download it, hopefully. There we are, and there it is. So if I open that, it should open the CSV file that we've just created over the top. So there it is in all its glory. So very easy to export uh, the sort of um, the various things that you're working with in, in these models. And you do the same thing for figures, which we'll, which we'll also look at as we go, uh, go through this. So I'm going to throw the sort of uh the questions will over you what what do you want to see this do basically so we're going to do some chemometrics analysis which uh is a type of well it's an approach to multivariate analysis so things like pca nmds those kinds of things um so from here where where do you think we should go from this so we know what is in the data set what do you think 
a first step might be. Not an overly chatty bunch. Any ideas? Maybe some exploratory data analysis? So let's just ask it to do some EDA for us. So uh, can you carry out some basic exploratory data analysis on the original data file? Let's see what it does. So we've given it very little guidance here. OK, we're just going to see what it what it does. Uh, so it's telling us that it's going to create basic summary statistics for each column. Then it will create some visualizations. Let's see what it actually does. Um, because there's a large number of columns, a complete analysis of uh, because there's a large number of columns, a complete analysis will not be feasible. So they'll just do the first few numerical columns and categorical variables. Probably not that useful to us. So let's see what it actually does and whether we can refine our prompt to uh, make this better. But let's see what it does for us. Let's give it the benefit of the doubt initially. So you'll see it's churning away here. Let's see what it's actually doing. So it's imported uh, map uh, plot lib dot plot and seaborn. So those are two data visualization packages from um for python and it is not plotting anything of what i would call value uh personally because just as an example it's given me a bar chart of the number of samples that are in my uh data set but i know each sample has only one value because it's one sample and similar issue for the uh the groups I know each group has three samples associated to it, so not particularly useful. What has it done for the different chemicals? So it's given us a number of chemicals, so histogram of C2, and then uh, this is the uh, the abundance across the bottom here, but it's uh, split out. So again, not overly useful. So how do you think we could improve this? Does somebody want to suggest how I might be able to improve my pr uh, prompt for this? So as a reminder, the, the original prompt was, uh, can you carry out some basic exploratory data analysis on the original data file? How might I improve that prompt? So a lot of getting the best out of chat GPT is, uh, is about prompt engineering, uh, as it's sort of frequently uh, sort of referred to on Twitter and the like. OK, so it's all about engineering these really specific prompts that are uh, more targeted in giving you what you might might need. And I see that uh, Juliana said be more <coughs> be more specific, which is uh, good. Will it heat map it? OK, it's a good question. So let's ask it to create a heat map. So let's see if it will create a heat map. So James is uh, quite right, but um, chemical data in this like this is quite frequently visualized with a heat map. So a heat map is probably the best way to uh, visualize it. Arguably, so what has this done? This has done a correlation heat map, which is probably not what we're looking for in terms of a visualization because it's correlating the uh, the abundance of the chemicals uh, with one another. So we could ask it to, or we could refine that prompt. Oh, I just typed ask it. So we could ask it to uh, create a clustered heat map with the, uh, can't remember what the exact terminology is in the uh, thing. Now is it sample? Yes, yeah, sample. But let's see if this will improve our uh, our heat map. So 
there we go that's looking a little bit more like it so it is now uh given us a heat map with the samples on the y-axis and the some of the chemicals on the uh, x-axis and it's a clustered heat map so it's showing us where these uh different group uh different uh, samples are now uh clustering together based on the abundance of uh the different chemicals found in the um in the samples so this is quite a nice way to get a good idea of what chemicals might be driving some of the sort of patterns that we see across the samples so you don't need to worry too much about what these uh about these different samples mean but they're all different types of thrips and uh you can see that there is some clustering going on here so it's telling us so it's provided the 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 heat map for us and again we could get the code for that the python code for that if we wanted it um but it's got the output and uh, it explains the or interprets the heat map as well for us which is arguably one of the nicer features of the code interpreter is that it will give you the output the code and interpret uh interpret it interpret it for you so we've had some suggestions in the comments of things we can do so identify tests so two comments are very similar so looking at what type of test would be best for the data then do that one so we can ask it um what statistical test would you use to analyze this data so we're using it as a statistical uh consultant now so a t-test or ANOVA, <coughs> chi-square test, correlation test, uh, regression analysis, non-parametric tests. So we gave it a very, very generic uh, prompt there, and it's given us very generic answers back, right? So I know for a fact, but very few of these tests were in fact, none of those tests would be appropriate for the type of data that we want to. Um, but we want to analyze because we want to be using multivariate statistics for this particular problem, so we could ask it what multivariate statistics. Could we use to analyze this data? And I think this this highlights uh, one of the potential pitfalls for chat GPT and code interpreter more generally is that unless you have some level of understanding uh, it's very easy to be led down the wrong path probably and not uh, necessarily do the correct thing because uh, it's very easy to get sort of persuaded by these types of things if you don't know don't know any better so that is my one sort of warning is but these tools are powerful and they're great but you still have to have some fundamental knowledge. Otherwise, what you're producing is usually a load of old rubbish. So you do need to. Um, you do need to know what you're doing. So what we could do, uh, or indeed what I would suggest we do is a principal component analysis. So run a PCA on the data explain why we have done this but let's see if it can tell us why it's going to run a pca on the data so it's a dimensionality reduction technique so reducing complex data into a uh, fewer number of dimensions especially useful when dealing with data as a large number of variables which we do we have lots of chemical compounds which is why the eda didn't particularly work very well and it allows us to simplify the complexity. So it's given us a bit of an introduction to what we're doing. It's now running the uh, PCA and we've hit an error. So this is where the, um, the code interpreter has hit an error for some reason. Uh, what is the error? OK, so the name NP is not defined, so there's an undefined variable in there. So the beauty of this is that it will go back and try and fix its own errors in an, in a uh, iterative process. Uh, this is also being adapted for things like agent GPT, uh, but I think this is more sophisticated. And you can see that it managed to fix the problem itself. Um, so it had to then import NumPy as NP, so it was missing this particular package. Uh, it's gone back and it has 
uh, done the PCA, which is all good. And it's produced a uh, cumulative explained variance plot, which is not the standard way of uh, visualizing this type of analysis. It, it's a way, but most people would um, produce a biplot for this uh, data. So let's produce a biplot and let's see what it does. So I, probably while it's churning through that, I'll, I'll, I'll explain this bit here. So what this has done is uh, this is the number of principal components. And in theory, each chemical is a principal component. And what it's done is it's reduced that dimensionality. And this is the, the amount of variance that it can explain. And as it plateaus towards one, that means that it, no more variance can be explained. So what it's suggesting here is that after 10 um, components about here, we're kind of reaching the maximum. So we can reduce the num the dimensions of data down to 10 for uh, for this. So here we are. So this is our uh, PCA uh, biplot. It is not particularly easy to see uh, the different uh, clusters. The, the color uh, palette is very, um, yeah, very challenging to see there. But we can use uh, some prompts to change the pattern. So as an example, to change the appearance. So let's change the um, let's change the appearance of those of those crosses. So turn each uh, point into a different symbol based on group, and make each group a. Uh, exciting color oops so you can uh, basically iterate iterate the design of these data visualizations that it produces and it should uh, be able to cope with most changes aesthetic changes relatively easily uh, without too much uh, pain so you'll see it's writing the code uh, and it will execute it and hopefully no, it hasn't. So there's an error here. So let's see what happens. So it's missed one of the points in the marker and colored dictionary. So it's got nothing to plot it against. So let's see if it fixes it now. As it goes through. So it's just going back through the code. Hopefully it's now got. There we are. So this is a little bit easier to see. The colors are a bit more bold uh, and the different uh, shapes also help to. Um, to uh, sort of allow us to sort of visualize the, those clustering. So you can see there are some cluster or there is some clustering of the different uh, groups. So some are more tightly clustered than others. The OF3 group of thrips seems to be more uh, sort of dispersed than some of the others. But one of the other features you quite often see is 95% uh, confidence uh, intervals uh, around these. So uh, add then confidence interval uh, intervals to each group and show on the plot. So hopefully this will now go through that process, add the 95% confidence intervals to to the plot. Hopefully shouldn't be a huge task for it to do that. Now, if you don't know what we're doing, or if you don't know PCA, again, there's another problem. What's happening here? So it's dropping nuisance. OK, that's fine. So we'll keep going. So there is a group issue. Uh, sorry, an issue with the group column, which is categorical. So it's going to uh, change those. So it included group. Uh, include the include the group column in its calculation of the mean. So it's going to remove that column and uh, hopefully do the thing we want it to do. But while it's doing this, um, there we are. Good. So it's added uh, the 95% confidence intervals. So it takes the mean of the different samples in the group and that becomes the central point. I'll wait for it to finish typing because it's going to keep going down as I'm highlighting bits. So it, 
it takes the uh, the the central point there, and you could add a centroid. So add a centroid point. Uh, oops, point to each group on this plot. That's the centroid point for the uh, ninety-five percent confidence intervals to each plot. So it's going to now add a central point, which is also another common feature. I arguably could have stacked that prompt into the previous prompt to uh, to shortcut it. Um, but while it's doing that, um, we'll let it just churn through that. So up until this point, are there any questions with what we're what you've seen? No. OK, so Satiri has asked uh, we can ask which chemicals are uh, the most detrimental in segregating the samples. Yep, we could definitely do that. We'll ask it a question. We'll ask it that uh, as the next prompt or the prompt after the next one. So you can see now that it's added a central uh, red point to this. Probably wouldn't want to use a red one because there's already a sample um, that is colored red, the OF2. So I would, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to churn through the whole thing again, but I would ask it to change the color of that central point to black. As, uh, as an example, uh, just to make it distinct from any of the other uh, colors being used in um, in this particular visualization. So if I was to ask somebody, how do you interpret that? Uh, and they're perhaps not familiar with principal component um, analysis, we could um, ask it to interpret, oops, interpret this plot and summarize the key insights in 50 words. So let's see if it can now interpret that plot um, uh, and give me some information. So it's not very, it's pretty generic. So it's saying some groups overlap significantly, suggesting similar data patterns while others are distinct. Centroids provide a clear reference for the uh, average position of each group within this multivariate space. And that's fine. But perhaps we want to do something a bit more tangible um there um so we could ask it to um so oh ed, ed, ed has made a suggestion there write me a figure legend so let's ask it to write a figure legend let's see if it comes up with anything better this is where prompt engineering is uh really important here we go so this by plot visualizes the first two principal components of the data set with individual samples represented by markers colored according to their group. And then it goes through 95% confidence intervals for the, each group represented by ellipses in the corresponding group color, providing a visual representation. The axes centroids of each group are marked with red dots. The axes represent the scores of the first two principal components, which capture the majority of the variance in the data. So that's pretty, that's a pretty nice figure. It's not perfect, but for the purposes of what we're doing today, it's fine. And perhaps we want to quantify differences between these different groups. So we can statistically uh, validate whether there are differences. And uh, I know this because I've, I was playing with this this morning, that if I ask it to give me a test that will allow us to determine the differences between those, it will give us an answer. So hopefully this is going to suggest um, a test called a permutational ANOVA, but let's see. I can't remember. So this one is looking. So this is said uh, an ANOVA initially, but it's not suitable. So we could use a MANOVA, which is a multivariate analysis of variance. And um, even though I didn't ask it to, it's now going to just go through and do this automatically for us. So we'll just let it churn through. And it's going to give us the results. So four different test statistics, Wilkes Lambda, Pillai's Trace, Hotelling, Lawley Trace, and Roy's Greatest Route. Some of the, the great, uh, great names. And so it's suggesting that group variable has a significant effect on the multivariate response formed by the numerical columns. And while it's telling us that there are significant differences, it doesn't tell us where these, uh, where these groups are different. So we would need to, um, to answer that question, we'd have to do further analysis. 
pairwise comparisons or discriminant analysis. So let's ask it to do a discriminant analysis. And what you'll probably note is that <coughs> as it's doing this uh, and the code it's producing is all in Python. So the code interpreter at this point, while well, just while it's churning through that latest uh, thing, the code interpreter only can execute code and uh, in Python at the moment. I, my understanding is that OpenAI, the system behind this, are actually um, trying to incorporate other programming languages. R, Julia uh, have all been mentioned as potential um, uh, potential uh, languages that are going to be next uh, in this. But I'll show you how you can kind of work around that if you only want to code in Python. So has it finished doing this? No, it's still going. So there seems to have been an issue. Apologies for the confusion. Error occurred because the linear discriminant analysis transformation resulted in more than two linear discriminants. But we only tried to create a data frame with two columns. OK, let's just see what it uh, does here. I've not got I've not uh, done this uh, previously. So. So there we are. So it's produced as a plot. OK, so it's not really answered the question so much as quantify or giving us a P value, if you like, for the uh, for the differences. However, I know you can run a permutation or ANOVA on uh, this type of data to get those uh, differences. Now, if I ask it to run a permanova, we will see. Uh, we will see an error message, I think, because this will demonstrate. Um, but it doesn't have access to the pipe, a lot of the. Um, a lot of the packages, although. I think there may have been an update because SciPy wasn't uh, wasn't available when I tried to use this. Uh, yesterday, so maybe that they've updated their environment to include some additional packages. No, they haven't. OK, here we are. Good. So SciPy wasn't available yesterday, but it looks like they've added that. But so this one. Uh, SK Bio is the required library for performing the perm ANOVA and it's not available in the environment, so it can't run uh, this. Again, it's now iterating through to the next um, library to, to run this and it will uh, try and install this. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it will try and install it like this. It will give you the code to install it, assuming that you can run it locally, but I don't run Python locally. I run it in Colab, so you could arguably uh, fire up Google Colab and, and do the analysis using uh, this in Colab, but a per man over would not be possible via code interpreter because the libraries just don't exist um, for it. So that's a very sort of crash course into code interpreter and its capabilities. If you want to save um, figures, uh, just as we did before, I'll just uh, demonstrate it. Save the LDA uh, plot in high resolution. And uh, hopefully it will loop back and save that as a downloadable um, downloadable file. So I think the important thing here is that a lot of this is really powerful, but you still need to know what you're doing. And like I've already said, it's in. Um, it's all in Python, right? So how do you? Get this to work with R and the answer is you can't directly, but you could say, for example, convert the Python code used to import this data file and run the PCA into uh, into R code and it will then go through and try to uh, convert that Python code into R code. It's not always perfect, I'll fully admit, but it does a pretty good job at getting you 95% of the way there and you can troubleshoot um, a few of these things. So 
uh, it, it is possible to uh, to convert that Python code and r sort of replicate the analyses, if you like, in uh, in R, if you wish. And uh, yeah, that's all I've got for you uh, today. I, I'll answer any questions, and if you want me to type any prompts into GPT, well, I've got it here. Happy to do so. But uh, yeah. Thanks for that, Joe. That was uh, really fun to watch. Can I ask if anybody has any questions? I have a couple. But I'll, I'll ask if other people have comments or questions um, first. Anyone? Has anyone um, you didn't ask, or maybe you did ask this? Did you ask whether anyone had tried to use the um, the code interpreter? Um, uh, no, yeah. I, I just assumed that people hadn't paid for the uh, for the pro subscription, but maybe they have. My mm -hmm. when I've asked people in the past, they haven't pay, been paying for it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll make a maybe I'll make a couple of comments uh, in my own experiments with the code interpreter just in the last couple of days. And one one thing that I wanted to say about this is that um, they've flop this tool out there on the table. And it's so exciting that you can just type this stuff in and go. It's it's astonishing, really. I suspect that um, every software manufacturer um, will be scrambling to figure out how to efficiently incorporate this into their products. I know our studio is. Uh, we know Microsoft already has on a large scale, and we know that all of the other big tech companies are scrambling to either create tools so that littler businesses can use them or they've already launched their own tools. Um, as a researcher myself, speaking as a researcher, uh, I have already started using this to, um, if I have a hard problem and I'm feeling lazy, it is amazing to, uh, to ask a question. I found that you need to articulate the questions pretty well because I don't have the patience to ask it, you know, several questions personally and get a bunch of answers that don't satisfy me. Then I'll just suck it up and, you know, write the code myself. I have the skills to do that, obviously, but um, the thing that I observe with uh, students a lot, and may maybe it's undergraduate students or maybe taught master students, uh, and even other interesting people is that um, that uh, they want to they they come in they come in and see me and uh, there's already a data set in place and uh, then they want the stats advice on how to analyze it and um, I always think in that situation as I've I've said to many people who come to me with data sets that um, it's best next time you know I can help you no problem but it's best if we talk and decide how to analyze this before we collect any data. And this tool, awesome as it is, doesn't solve that particular problem. And the problem you are encountering here, even with a, you know, an entry level um, multivariate problem is that you did need to give it some detail. So for students that are entering science, starting their career in science, starting to collect data, I wanna think that, <clears throat> If you if you can separate the learning curve for taking on these scientific tools, one of them is um, learning how to ask questions critically, scientifically with data, so the thinking kinds of problems, versus the technical tools to to actually solve those problems with data. So uh, this kind of system, all in the future will promise to solve that second problem, but not the first one at all. <laughs> and I, I worry that it, um, I worry, it's a far too strong a word. I observe, <laughs> I observe that it could make the first problem worse. Um, I think this is an awesome tool. They probably will implement R in other languages, like you say. I, I haven't read that that's the plan. I see some other people are um, raising their hand. David? Yeah, as you was talking, Ed, I, before you actually finished, I was thinking, is there a danger that what's going to happen 
is that students will think, well, chat GBT, we can just absolutely throw everything in there, it will give us an answer, so we don't even need to go to the classes on the building blocks of how to take different types of data, what sort of test you would do. We can forget all that, all we'll do is get some results, bung it into chat GBT and it'll solve everything. Yeah, I, I think there is a bit of a risk in that. I, um, you know, I'm, I have a lot of mixed feelings about these tools. They're awesome. I want to use them too, and they're fun. But for students, uh, they're, I think they're more fun if you have some existing knowledge and, and you know how to carve the best out of it. Um, I, I wonder if it'll incentivize, you know, it's best practice, as we all know, to to use code to document reproducible analyses. I wonder if it will incentivize that for uh, for students of all levels uh, to use these tools. You could potentially turn it the other way around as a teaching tool. So you let the student make a mistake and then go, ah, ah, wrong, have another go, use something different. You could use it like that. What I, I sort of suspect if, if I had another um, one or two clones of myself, I suspect somebody will come along and uh, implement through the chat GPT API or some other large language model um, behind the scenes, and they will create a system that is a uh, supportive, smart, and um, uh, constructive critic of questions that are asked with data. So you can design, we, we can control the behavior of the agent here. I joked in the chat, um, start giving me your answers in the form of a um, Donald Trump tweet. But uh, you, you could design a tool like this that creates a an environment for the agent where it is that of a, a statistical consultant and the um, the, the the uh, user takes on the part of a student of science and uh, the answers would be framed in that context. And I, I suspect for even for a scientific tool for for normal scientists like us, that uh, a tool like that will be out pretty soon. I, I think that like our studio and um, similar similar um, institutions like that will be already thinking about that, working already very hard on it. <clears throat> Thank now, you. Juliana, uh, I don't want to call anybody out here, but I was very interested that you said you've been using R to generate, uh, or using ChatGPT to generate R code. I've found that it is astonishingly good it, as long as, um, as long as uh, you're articulate about what you ask, how, how do you think it works for that? And and you too, Joe, <laughs> if you've been using it for that too. Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, I think I show you what I did with my data and yeah. GPT, but you definitely need to know uh, like the basic, <laughs> at least yeah. to be able to ask the, the right questions. Otherwise, I don't know how it would work. Um, so that's why I think students need to have the basics anyway, because Otherwise, they wouldn't know what to ask. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I'd agree with that, I think. The other tool that I, I, mean, I don't know how much time people have got, but the other tool I've been using a lot recently is Claude, which is the other. Uh, so I just put this in as, a, as an example. Um, it doesn't work in the same way as Code Interpreter, i.e. it doesn't have a sandbox where it can run code, but you can upload up to five files. And I just had this really messy weather data from the uh, Harper Adams weather station, which, yeah, bit of a car crash uh, in terms of its formatting. And um, I, I, like Ed, I couldn't really be bothered to write the, um, the the R code to clean it up, but I also couldn't think of an articulate way to tell chat GPT that I wanted it to be cleaned up. So I asked it to write some R code that imports the file and cleans it so it's in a tidy format with all the uh, but of all the useful, I should have said useless, not useful information removed. And then it generated R code that I could just then copy and paste into R, obviously switch out um, or, or tell it where my um, where my working directory directory was, 
and it worked flawlessly. So this has been, and this is free. So Claude is completely free. Code Interpreter will do something very similar, but it costs $20 a month and you get the environment to execute code. But if you want a quick way of uploading files and getting sort of tailor made feedback or code written specifically for a particular file, this is a very good alternative uh, to chat GPT. And it seems to be very effective as well. I've not had any, I've not played with a lot, but I've not had any major issues uh, with the, the code that Claude has uh, generated for me. I haven't used, um, I haven't used this uh, Claude AI. I, I, well, I thought that I have when I see these. Uh, I've had this thought for the last couple of months since it's really exploded is that um, that uh, we're a lot of us are experimenting right in these fairly raw interfaces and um, we're designing prompts that do what we want and it's amazing. I, I mean, I found chat GPT 3.5 is amazing for R code and and four is not necessarily much better for R code anyway. Um, <clears throat> I found that uh, that 3.5 is faster too, but but in the future um, we're kind of talking and debating about whether you want to pay the twenty dollars a month. Um, I, I think that uh, just in the last couple of days there's been an open source large language model uh, announced. And there, there more will come. It's Llama Two, is a big one that's just been announced, and um, products will start being built with that immediately to compete with ChatGPT. And I don't know whether they're going to be nineteen ninety nine a month or less than that, but they'll they'll be competitive because this is full fully open source and released into the wild now, and you can play with it for free with just a little bit of, I probably for most of us. We'd have to use chat GPT to get the code so that we could play with it on Hugging Face where you can play with it for free. <laughs> it's it's amazing. Um, but most of us won't be using these interfaces, I suspect, in, a, in the short term. Uh, it'll change. Most of us will be using tools like, um, like that code interpreter. We'll be using that in VS Code, Microsoft's coding product. We'll be using chat GPT to... Um, Right, risk assessments. That is the best damn idea I've heard in this art club in a long time. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you I'm going to do that immediately. But uh, we'll be using that straight from Microsoft Word. Um, I, I suspect all products we already use and some new web-based products that we haven't used yet will be very specialized. I see Iona's face in the chat, and there will be some large language model um, uh, natural language processing, sentiment analysis, and uh, evidence um, gathering tools that will that will pop up sooner rather than later. Uh, they, they may or may not be on the ChatGPT website or other similar websites like the Claude website, but um, uh, this stuff will be changing quite quickly. Further comments? Interesting paper on the decline of it. Is that the one about the mutations from eating its own tail? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's nothing more than simply interesting uh, yeah. because I think you're right, but the sort of open source alternatives like Llama to, uh, and he, indeed Bard is fine. They've got Palm 2 now. Is Bard is also really good at R-Code. I've played with it extensively too. Yeah, so there's a lot of things. So I think ChatGPT are potentially uh, slightly worried by this recent paper it's an interest if you're interested in data science and large language mo language modules it it's quite interesting read otherwise you can probably ignore it but i thought ed might like it so i dropped it in the chat yeah i will look at it, it there's one i read recently that just came out in the last couple of days that and, and there'll be a lot of papers that'll come out quickly about this i suspect mm -hmm. is that you have these um you have these these large language models, they're trained at some point in time, uh, then they're frozen, uh, but some can fold more data back in. And what the what the researchers are thinking, and they're producing some strong evidence to this effect, is that because the internet will now be swamped with large language model generated 
stuff. It, there will be, a, I heard someone on Twitter call it a, um, describe this effect as a regression to the mean. <laughs> so the, the, <laughs> the outstanding parts of human productivity and creativity will uh, start to be uh, incorporated and mixed with the, you know, kind of average outputs of amazing that they are of these large language models and it, it will start to mutate the training of the model itself and so the performance will degrade over time yeah that's interesting um, stuff very interesting thanks joe that is very exciting pleasure um, uh, i think that uh we have soteria on board for next week i think that our experiments with chat gpt and similar things will continue i think that um 